All right. All right, we're ready to go. Little technical difficulty there. We got it figured out. Right. Welcome. This is Escape Pod, episode 11. Made it into double digits last week. Um, for those who are new, uh, I am Sean McComber. With us also is Todd Fector. We are professors at University of Texas at Dallas. This is our uh, streaming channel where we sort of have fun <laughs> showing our projects, things we're working on, and now uh, have been introducing guests uh, for, for our viewers. Uh, so we're trying this out. Oh, we got lots of people. Well, lots of people in the chat already. That's nice. excellent. Uh, Todd, take it away. Yeah, well, our, our goal here on Escape Pod is to kind of introduce fun things about animation, have discussions about animation, learning about animation, making projects, and um, we have a very special guest with us today, Mr. Uh, Mike Altman, uh, who's a modeler at Pixar and is a former colleague and friend. Um, and what I thought I would do is show you a little bit about what we want to talk about today. And Mike, we were I was kind of stumbling through my Instagram. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here, Sean. Oh, no. So bear with us here. There's going to be some technical. There you go. So Todd's sharing his screen, and I'm going to reorder this on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> I will do my best. Well, we I was kind of going through my Instagram and uh, again, kind of uh, being friends with Mike on Facebook and then my Instagram kind of being uh, following him. I started to see all these awesome, awesome models that were popping up and I didn't know what it was. And I started looking into it um, and started to see how Mike was going through and taking some amazing conceptual artwork of characters uh, and turning them into 3D models that matched exactly what was being shown in the sketch. Um, some very, very fun stuff. And one of the things that we like to talk about a lot when we're trying to teach modeling is how important things like feel and scale and proportion and all these things that, that kind of happen first before you're worrying about building a proper mesh and all that kind of fun stuff. And uh, to that end, what we thought we would do is bring Mike on to talk more about this process so we can all learn a little bit more about what he's doing, how he's doing it, and the types of things he's experimenting with. Uh, so I'm going to unshare oh. that. Oh, did I catch you off guard, Sean? You did catch me off guard, but that's <laughs> all right. Sorry about that. So with that, hello, Mike. Welcome to the show. Hello. Um, again, this, this stuff is absolutely amazing. Uh, and Sean and I were looking at it. And, and what's awesome is the simplicity that kind of is under the hood, but the way it reads as so much more complex and, and just the emotion and the feel of everything and how it's matching the feel of those sketches. So what we were hoping you could do for us and for our viewers today is just walk us through a little bit about how this idea came about and some of the process sure. of in creating one of these. Yeah, um, I mean, so last summer, everything was kind of locked down. Everybody is, you know, working from home, kind of a shut in. And I like felt like I wanted to kind of keep being creative. I suddenly had a ton of extra free time on my hands. And for the first time ever, I had like my work set up at home. So I had like all the tools at my disposal all the time in the world and, you know, wanting to be creative. So um, I, I, I don't exactly know what started it, but, you know, I was like, oh, I'm going to find, you know, I, I love um, illustrators and concept artists. And I'm always kind of like on the look, look out for, for cool images. Um, and I years ago I did kind of like a fun little 3D sketch of of an elephant, um, Tantor the elephant, and I thought, oh, maybe I'll you know kind of do like the adult version, you know, the him as an adult versus like him as a baby that I did a few years ago. And I posted it, and it you know it was like got a great response, and it was really fun to do. And so I just kind of started doing more and more, um, and it just sort of kind of blew up from there. Like, um, I just got really into it and started posting about like, you know, a sketch a week if I could. Um, and it's been super fun. Like, not only have I been kind of able to expand my sort of repertoire in terms of like style, um, I've met so many cool people. Um, oftentimes I'll, I'll be in touch with the um, concept artist before or after I, I sort of take on their their work and do a sketch and they're always like blown away and so excited to see their models in 3D. 
So that's been really rewarding. Um, I've even started like mentoring some students. I had uh, uh, someone reach out from DreamWorks who started this program called Animation Flow. And he, it was basically like his version of Animation Mentor. Mm -hmm. um, and he wanted to expand it kind of more into the different areas of production. Um, so I kind of partnered with him and have been doing like mentoring for modelers a couple days a week and that's been super fun. So it's really kind of what started as just kind of like a, a personal project and you know just something to kill time <laughs> has turned into you know some just a really cool you know thing for me to do and and opened up lots of interesting opportunities. So that's yeah, awesome. it's been really great. Where are you finding your sketches and your and the art? Um, I most of it is on Instagram actually. Um, there's so many incredible concept artists who post like very regularly to Instagram. And the more I started kind of like interacting with them, the more it started suggesting people for me to follow. Sure. Um, and, and yeah, so mostly through there, I would say. Um, They're not necessarily people that you know, though. It's just artists that you like. Oh, not, yeah, not at all. Okay. Um, and in fact, like every time I would get a new follower, I would just kind of like glance over and see like, is this an illustrator? Is this a <laughs> and I sort of like mine their, you know, gallery for, for some interesting images. So I'm, I'm always kind of like pulling kind of cool, um, concept images, um, aside, I've got like a little inspiration folder. So I always, you know, when I'm ready to do another sketch, I, I kind of know where to go and can quickly choose awesome. from some options that I already have kind of like pre-vetted so I can kind of get jump right into it. Well, I think, I think one of the things that I thought was really awesome about these and looking at them was that, you know, to build a full on model, like if you were to build a full on production type model, it takes a long time. There's a lot involved yeah. with it. Um, and, and for me personally, I, I don't have the patience. I, I want to yeah. do stuff really quick and get in and make something really cool and then move on to something else and really cool. And, um, that's what I love so much about what I was seeing there is that it feels like a sketch. It feels like it's a, it's the beginnings of what could end up being a way more complicated model, but these are perfect. They're they're perfect expression of the uh, the designs or the artwork that don't need to go any further. It just yeah move on to another one. And like you said, uh, just the fact that people have been gravitating towards it so much uh, because I think it's awesome. It just it, it seems much more. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Much more. Uh, it's just like a really expressive uh, and freeing kind of way yeah, to exactly work. exactly and. Right. Like ironically enough, it's something that I kind of picked up um, way back when, when we worked together at DNA. Um, like I would, I remember doing some um, some work where we would build a character in pose, yep. and then and kind of get that signed off on, mm -hmm. and then kind of like reverse engineer it, neutralize it into like the finished model. Right. I had never seen that really done anywhere before or since, actually. But I think it's it's such an intuitive way of working because you can kind of like instantly get into the expression and the right. the personality of the character, right. and then the technical stuff you know is the easy part really. Right comes well, later, it, and it's nice too because the T pose doesn't really help you in any way, right? The T pose right. is so neutral; there's no character in it. You're basically stripping yeah. it out. Um, yeah, and these things just exude character, so. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to get a director excited about seeing, you know, tumbling around a T-pose character because it doesn't give them any anything to key into. You know what I mean? They're they're writing the story. They're, um, you know, directing the story. They they have that kind of like personality and characterization in their mind, and so seeing just kind of like you know, neutral arms out, eyes closed, like there's just nothing for them to really dig into. So. Yeah, th this seems like a much more um, like direct way, and and it actually you know saves time in the end because you're you're right. not sort of like spinning your wheels on right. making a T pose model that you don't know if it'll actually work. Well, they feel they feel like proxies, right? It feels like like I said, it could grow into a final thing. But the thing I love about them, and the thing that that we try to teach or I try to teach in a lot of the classes, the modeling classes, is basically that the like I said, the mesh flow and all that stuff kind of comes secondary to the form and to the to the purport and getting and hitting the look and the feel of whatever it is. 
Yeah. But I love too that this process, and we can take if you can explain this process to to the viewers and whatnot. Sure. Um, really gives them a leg up on proportion and scale. And how do you make it feel just like that thing without worrying about some of those other parts that can come later on, like you're saying, if you want to neutralize it or you want to create the final model? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the, the beauty of this, um, of this technique. Like it's uh, going to screen share mode, if that's okay. Oh, yeah. One second. <laughs> All right. Bear with me, everyone. I will be getting everything set up. Yeah, so, so essentially, um, you know, it all kind of starts with the, the concept and the, the 2D sketch that I'm working from. Um, I'm, I'm really particular in the kind of artwork I look for in the sense that I'm looking for something that has a, an appealing, like, clear silhouette, um, something that has kind of like is dynamic and has some kind of energy behind it um and has the most important thing i would say like just has a really clear essence like if i can look at a piece of artwork and just in an instant really feel what it is that the artist is communicating um i know that that's kind of like a great start for me to kind of like take it into a 3D sketch. So this is an image um, drawn by a concept artist named Annette Marnat. And I just, I loved the pose, the, the kind of angularity um, of the arm and the, you know, the torso and the way the legs are so almost like hyperextended. Um, you know, that arm tucked in, just everything about it, the, the restrained palette, I think it's just like so classy and just so beautiful. So this is an image I was really excited to, to try out. Um, so I'm going to show you guys just based, you know, some of the steps that go into um, creating these sketches. So let me just load up. Bear with me a second. And you're obviously using Maya uh, for yours right now, but this would work in just about anything, correct? Yeah, yeah. I use Maya because I'm really, really comfortable with it and because I had access to it. Um, I'm, I have used ZBrush here and there, and I know I've seen people kind of like try this technique in ZBrush, and it's it actually works great. Um, I think ZBrush is a little bit more limited in terms of like, you know, real time kind of transparency and that sort of thing, which, which I tend to rely on a lot. Um, but if you're okay with like rendering, um, things, then that shouldn't really be an issue. In my case, I, I want to spend the maximum time like sketching and sculpting in 3D and the minimum of time um, worrying about like shading and lighting and rendering. So that's why I basically am in Maya the whole time um, and using Viewport 2.0, which makes things look really good in terms of like, you know, anti-aliasing and um, ambient inclusion and that sort of thing. Um, I end, what I post are just screen grabs, basically, of the viewport. So um, when I'm working on a sketch, I basically try to limit my, my work time on it to about three, maybe four sessions. And the, the reason behind that is that I want, these are meant to be kind of like quick explorations they're not really meant to be kind of like laborious, um, you know, super detailed kind of representations. I'm, I'm kind of like going for a quick read. They're not really meant to be like scrutinized really close up. They're not meant to move either. I mean, these are like 3D sketch, like, you know, sculptures. And so the first step and the, my first sitting, um, basically I am just blocking things out in super simple shapes. And you can see that like, you know, these are just, I call it my blob technique. And I'm just, you know, taking simple shapes. I start with a cube, you know, we'll smooth it, maybe one subdivision level and use that kind of over and over again. Um, so like the same object I'm using to block in, you know, the, the glasses I'm also using for the ear. And then I scaled it up and used it for the shirt and, 
um, you know, just kind of like lots of uh, reuse of the same simple objects. And the key um, in this technique is I'm constantly jumping in and out of, uh, you know, lights on, lights off mode. And the reason behind that is that at this stage, it's really important to um, kind of capture the, the silhouette, the balance, the shaping, um, you know, even in such a simplified, you know, modeling technique, you can still really, you know, nail that, the kind of pose and, and energy. Um, and this comes together really quickly. This is, you know, maybe a couple hours of work. And this is kind of like the backbone of the process. Like once you've kind of like worked out the, the silhouette and it's kind of working in 3D, I'm, I'm constantly moving around it, tumbling around um, with the lights out just to make sure that it's always reading in 3D. And, you know, I'm kind of like, I, I work from one image. And so there are so many kind of things that I have to sort of like fill in the blanks. Like, I don't know exactly what his leg positions are sort of like in Z depth, you know what I mean? I don't know if this leg is really pushed out. I mean, it, it is a little bit, but you know, like that his elbow, is it kind of like, you know, is it pressed in? Is it kind of like behind him? Um, there's so much kind of like exploration that that happens sort of, you know, at this stage where I'm really kind of working it out and sort of doing a lot of 3D problem solving to make sure it kind of works in three dimensions. So can I ask a question, Mike? Yeah. So while you're going through this, do you tend to work predominantly in the perspective view or do you jump out to orthographics at all? Because I know the orthographics have no perspective in them. So it actually cheats the eye. It, it's not accurate, right? Right. I'm, I'm just wondering if you stay in perspective or if you ever do hop out. That's a great question. I do stay in perspective for the most part because, and I will typically like change my camera settings. You know, the, the focal length is by default 35 millimeter. And that tends to, like if you've ever taken a photo, you know, of someone and you bring the camera really close to do a portrait, it'll really distort their face and kind of go like, you know, slightly fisheye. Um, so in order to kind of minimize that distortion, I'll typically like bump the, the default camera um, focal length to 50 or 60. And that's sort of my, my kind of go-to. Um, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in the perspective window for the most part, just because it's, it comes together like just really, really organically and loosely. And I'm not really worried about um, like matching anything perfectly. Um, so session two, um, using that same, you know, those same shapes, I start to get some shading in there. And the reason behind that is I'm trying to kind of get to kind of capture the, the look and feel of the sketch as quickly as I can. So there's only kind of so far you can get with, you know, working in grayscale. Um, so I'll start to, to develop some shaders. I use a, a mix of Fong's um, and Lambert's. I like to keep it them pretty flat because um, I want to kind of minimize the, you know, distracting kind of glossy surface materials and really kind of like key in still to the overall shape and pose. Um, so at this stage, I'm also doing some kind of creative problem solving as far as, you know, ways to kind of get around the fact that I'm not rendering, right? So like one thing I love about this artwork is the way like the area behind the, the lenses of his glasses are kind of like, you know, brighter and glowing a little bit as though the stage lights are kind of like, you know, hitting that lens and like focusing down and really kind of like brightening up that area behind it. Um, again, since I'm not doing any rendering or, um, or shading really, uh, I kind of fake that in with modeling. And this is also something that we used to do at DNA all the time. Um, we would call, I think we had a word like stick ons or something like yeah, we would stick ons. Yeah. Like we would, it would just be 
all about just finding ways to make it work kind of in the viewport, nothing welded together because it didn't really matter. Um, so in this case, like these shapes, I just added a couple of shapes behind the lenses and applied, you know, a, a kind of brighter, um, but pretty transparent shader on them so that from a distance, you know, it totally look, kind of like gives the impression of that kind of like glowing, you know, lens effect, um, but just, you know, in a really simple, direct way. Like everything is just kind of like quick and brute force and meant to just get the, like capture the overall impression without kind of spending too much time, you know, trying to like get it to work physically with like actual lighting and shadows and rendering and that sort of thing. So a lot of times I'll actually like model in my own shadows as well. Like I don't rely on, on the tweaking the lights in the scene. Um, and it just gives a little bit more kind of like direct control. Um, so that's kind of like stage two. Um, is, that, is that just the default Maya lighting that you're using in the scene? Right now it is, yep. Okay. Um, in the next stage though, uh, I will kind of evaluate the artwork and be like, okay, if there were actual lights, you know, in this, uh, you know, in, in that illustration, where are they coming from? Like I'm trying to kind of decode like the directionality, the, the tone, the, the warmth, the intensity of the light. Um, if there are shadows in the scene, that can be kind of a good cue. And so for that, for that third step, I do kind of, um, you know, create lights uh, in the scene that uh, mimic what I'm seeing in the artwork. So in this case, I, I always start with an ambient um, and usually we'll have kind of like one spotlight, uh, one kind of key light from the front. And then maybe, a, you know, I'll duplicate that spotlight drop the intensity by half or something, move it to the back for like a little bit of fill. So generally speaking, I have like three lights, you know, in any one of these setups. Um, so again, notice none of them, I haven't really upgraded any of these shapes. These are still those same shapes from that first session. Um, but they're, you know, I'm kind of like layering more more techniques um, into this to make it feel more complete and more like the art. Um, one thing I love to do is um, kind of like shift the, the tonality and the kind of the color saturation and intensity through um, a technique that you can see here where I'll basically, um, you know, take the, the shapes that I've built, like for the hand, for the finger, for example, duplicate them, um, move them out a little bit, and then apply a different, um, like a, a really saturated kind of ambient um, shader, but that's very, very transparent. And so, I mean, one thing I, I just really loved in Annette's drawing is, you know, like, the kind of like, you know, really beautiful like fuchsia tones she's getting like on the inside of the palms and the inside of the fingers. And then on this hand, they're kind of like more peachy and pink. Um, I just love that kind of like effect. So, so that's something that I achieved. Um, again, it, it's all just such brute force. And, and when, you, when you zoom in, like you can kind of see, like it's just the same exact shape duplicated um, and it's so transparent that, you know, you can barely see it on a white background, but the ambient is kind of like kicked up. So it's pretty bright. It's like bright and transparent at the same time. So I kind of like layer those on where I want to, you know, kind of pop the color out a little bit. And it's almost like, um, almost like a, like a watercolor wash. Uh, I, I like to think of this technique almost like painting in 3D because I'm, I'm working with volumes um, and just kind of like layering them kind of with, with different levels of transparency. Um, another thing I want to bring up now that I mentioned the word volumes, 
it, it's really critical that everything is a volume in the way I work. So like, even in this case where you think, oh, that's, you know, that's a line that, you know, that I'm trying to kind of create on the ear, but everything is like actually a volume that's just kind of like, you know, pressed into the surface and just what's revealed is kind of reads as a line. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The reason I do that is because, you know, even for this, you'd think like, oh, that's just sort of a plane that's sitting on the surface. Like, no, this is actually a volume too that's, that's sort of pressed in. And, and what you're seeing is just the part that's revealed. And the reason I do that is because number one, it's, it's faster to work with volumes. You're not kind of like, you know, fiddling with, with edges that can kind of become wobbly and wiggly from different angles. Um, but since these are, you know, fairly low res volumes, as you kind of bring them closer together and collide them into each other, you just kind of like automatically get these kind of like nice simplified arcing shapes. Um, and, and that way, you know, it's just kind of like a, a way to sort of speed up the process. Um, another thing I, I love trying to incorporate in, um, in these sketches is, is line work. So like in this case, you know, again, going back to that hand, like Annette has this like beautiful sort of like lost and found kind of like outline effect where, you know, it's like thicker in some parts, thinner in other parts. It, it, it's got like a tone, it's not just black outlines. Um, so one thing I like to, to do is again, same thing as the, as kind of like using that, those duplicated volumes to, to tone something. Um, I do the same thing for outlines. So in this case, I selected the, the, the prims I had for the finger shapes, um, duplicated them, scaled them up just a little bit on their normals, and then inverted the normals. And so basically, what it, the effect it creates is, you know, we're looking through the front face. Um, and what, what, what we're reading as the outline is just where it's wrapping around behind that volume. Does that make any sense? That, that's awesome. So you're basically taking a, the, the same primitive shape, flipping its normals around. So the inside, it's basically facing inside, and yep. it's gonna be dark and the outside has a transparency so you won't see it. Yes, it's, you have to make sure that it's set to single-sided. Yeah, that's um, awesome. And, and yeah, and so I use that over and over and over again. Um, and like kind of depending on sort of where you place that shape, you can kind of get like thinner and thicker lines. Um, you know, you can just kind of like modify that to, you know, kind of adjust things. And, and that quickly you have this, this outline that will kind of like travel around in 3D. Yeah, it's like, a, it's like a fake tune line. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like using pain effects or something. Yep, and I, I do that all over the place and, and with different like colors and transparencies. Like in this case, um, I've done the same thing, but the outline, rather than being black, um, it's just it's like a very very transparent peach color. So from a distance, you know, it just kind of gives you like the indication of of kind of like a warm outline, um, without like kind of a you know a harsh kind of like you know black outline shape there. And Annette like uses beautiful kind of colored lines this way. So you know I'm kind of trying to mimic that in in my version of the sketch. So that, I mean, that's basically the technique. I, I also love to rely on ramps for, uh, in, in different ways. Like in my, uh, uh, a ramp is just a really kind of quick way to get, you know, some attribute to, you know, kind of attenuate from, from point A to point B. So in this case, you know, I, I wanted to kind of recreate this sort of like transparency you know, sort of down the, the cable of the microphone. So I just grabbed the, this shape that I had built, you know, did a planar projection of the UVs and then basically gave it uh, a ramp in the transparency to just kind of make it fall off by the time it got to the bottom. So 
it's just kind of like layering really simple techniques to create like kind of as quickly as possible kind of match the the energy and kind of capture the essence of the artwork and and that's it like i i really don't do much more um there's not like heavy sculpting or anything i mean if i'm you know, I, if I'm wanting to add some anatomy and things like that, like I'm, I'm really just like pressing kind of shapes into the surface here and there where I want to indicate kind of an anatomical moments. Um, but yeah, it's really kind of like all about that first session of, of really kind of dialing in the, the, the pose, the, the weight, the, the energy of, of the artwork that can come through so clearly, even when you're just dealing with really simple shapes. Um, so sometimes I'll just, you know, I have so much fun just kind of working on the, the blocking in phase um, that some, some of the images I post to Instagram are, are just that blocking in phase. Um, but they're still so, so fun and kind of quick to do. And really like so much of the energy of the artwork still comes through just in that, in that one sitting. And then, yeah, so this is something that you could really kind of like tumble around, show a director, get them excited. And then if we wanted to, you know, modify this and, and kind of like re reverse engineer this into the, into the final character, you could easily, you know, neutralize the pose, retopo it, and you're on your way, you know? Yeah, I think your technique is awesome simply because hey, it looks fantastic, but it works in three dimension. Right. So it's not just about capturing that one, you know, front three quarter or whatever the view is, but it works spinning around yeah. the entirety of the whole and a lot of it that you can't see. So you're also filling in those details, which I think is really nice. Totally. Yeah. And that's the fun thing. I mean, I, I actually like working with some um, really like sketchy artwork, too, like that's not resolved um, and sort of finding the character kind of like in that you know, in that kind of loose line work, like that's super fun too, and, and works really well for this technique. Sometimes even better than the the images that are, are really kind of tight. Um, so for this artwork, um, it's done by a concept artist named Amanda McFarlane. And I just, when I saw it, I just like instantly fell in love with the, with the image. It just, there was like such this like, such a beautiful kind of subtlety to it. I love the, and remember when I was saying like, you know, I'm looking for, for kind of like a dynamic pose. I mean, there's nothing especially dynamic about this pose, but I mean, the hair is sort of like fluttering off in, in an elegant way. Um, but it, it has such a strong essence to me. Um, the, the sideways glance, the tilt of the head, the, you know, the, the flow, it's just, I mean, flow is kind of a good word to just sort of describe this. Um, and, you know, the, it had kind of this like effortless elegance that I just fell in love with and I thought could really make for a great sketch. Um, so I'll show you some of the steps that went into this one, which are, are pretty similar. Um, all right, so let me open up that one. So in this case, um, you know, started with, with building, building up the face and um, I kind of like, so in this case, I, I started with the, you know, the face more upright just because it was easier to build than, than doing it in that diagonal pose. But one thing I wanted to kind of point out immediately is I don't work with like symmetry um and i think a lot of times for 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 modelers especially beginning modelers like there's this fear of like oh no if i turn symmetry off or it somehow it gets out of sync like you know i it's kind of like stressful like it'll kind of get away from me and i you know you know if one eye isn't the same exact shape as the other like you know it won't it won't look right or you know there's just this kind of like anxiety around that. And I, I totally felt that too. And I, I, I remember what that felt like. Um, 
but I think it's nice to be able to kind of like break yourself from that a little bit if possible and like lean into it. I mean, no, no face is perfectly symmetrical and, you know, especially one that has like character to it. Um, and so I, I tend to just kind of like, you know, work pretty loosely. Um, I don't work with like symmetry turned on in any, any sense. I mean, I sometimes will take objects and, you know, elements and duplicate them and move, move them to the other, other side, but I'm not kind of like working with, um, you know, like if you're sculpting in ZBrush or something, like I, I wouldn't tend to have like the, the symmetry tool on. It's, it's just kind of like, it's better to kind of uh, build it up sort of loosely. So can I ask a question, Mike? Yeah. When you're doing that, how much of this is actually pulling from either like planes of the face or your knowledge of anatomy, mm -hmm. just basic structures? Because I know a lot of students or yeah. a lot of when they're starting off on this, just jump right in and start trying to match things without thinking about the underlying structure. Because it looks like yeah. when I look at yours, you're still mm -hmm. accounting for the cheekbone. You're still accounting yep. for the, you know, the ridges around the eye, the brow ridge and everything else is all there in place in, in approximately the right spots. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I tend to like... I have an illustration uh, that I work, uh, that I refer to a lot. Um, it's someone I follow on Instagram. His name is uh, Mitch, Mitch something. Um, I can send you the link. Okay. Um, uh, he He's just an incredible an artist and he's got like a, a million plus followers and just, um, it's basically like he teaches people how to draw. And there's a, there's an image I, I love that he has where it just kind of like breaks up the, the head and uh, body into kind of like component parts. And you can get, I mean, there are a million um, kind of references for that sort of thing. But I like the way that he basically breaks things up into like four things. Um, you know, one, so I start with the kind of like brow shape, um, like forehead, forehead volume, um, one for the nose, that you know flares out at the bottom, but also flares out at the top to kind of like meet the the brows. Um, a shape that kind of indicates the sort of top of the face um, and cheekbones, and then a shape that kind of forms the the jaw. Um, so it's kind of like those four four components, and then you ha always have to have you know the rest of the cranium in the back and. A, a shape for the neck. Um, so if you look at at some of my sketches, you'll kind of see that that pattern of those kind of like four four base shapes over and over again. And it's just kind of a nice way to kind of quickly, you know, figure like kind of see or imagine the building blocks of of the head before you even kind of jump in. Um, yeah, that's a great question because, you know, I can imagine a student bringing this into Maya or any modeling package and, you know, creating a cube and start like subdividing it and just trying to pull the, the kind of anatomical moments out. And I think that is totally the wrong way to approach it, even though I know that a lot of times that's how modeling, character modeling is taught. And I know I, I taught it that way too back in the day. But I think it's, uh, you know, kind of blobbing things out and just sort of like mapping it out with very simple 3D shapes is a much, much better, faster and easier way to kind of capture the, the volumes of the face. Um, so the next step was kind of incorporating some of the hair and and again, you can see I'm working in, in grayscale. Um, you know, in this case, I, I incorporated a few different values of gray just to kind of help me figure, you know, kind of just organize some of the detail. Um, I really wanted to kind of pull out the lash shape the, and the, the iris placement because that was really important to, to the kind of feeling of the pose. That's another thing I wanted to kind of mention. It's it's so important um, in in really capturing an expression that the face be really really readable. 
Um, so I'll take, you know, extra kind of care in making sure that, you know, the eye whites feel really white. Um, a lot of times you'll see like renders of, of character models that students do and the face, facial expressions are a little bit hard to read. And that's because sometimes like, you know, the, the key light is hitting the eyeball and it's like really bright in one spot and then kind of like very quickly kind of falls off to gray, maybe even right. to black. And it just kind of like deadens the expression in a way. Um, so I'm always really um, careful about like, you know, when I create, drop a shader onto the eye white, I like crank up the ambient so that like it is, it reads kind of the same shape from all angles. It doesn't kind of fall off to a gray because you kind of want that, you know, the eyes are, are so critical in, in an expression. So eyes and teeth, I just make sure that like the ambient is, is high enough that it reads super, super clearly, um, no matter kind of what the lighting situation is. And, you know, like kind of for the same reason that, you know, some people wear makeup, you know, I really kind of like dial in some, um, some indication of, you know, brow, lash, um, in this case, it's, I literally just kind of like, you know, these are just clamshells. These are such simple shapes. Um, just kind of like, you know, cupped around a sphere for the eye. Um, it's kind of a quick way to get a, effective and, and really simple eye working um, really fast. Um, you know, just the same shape, top and bottom. Um, but I've... I've just colored some like the that outside ridge uh, of faces dark, just so you can really kind of start to read the the beautiful like almond shape of that eye. I think I think what's really cool about this one too, and in showing it in this state, is it shows how important the silhouette really is. Because mm -hmm. if you stop and look at this model right now, it feels kind of Frankenstein. Like it feels like a bunch of parts, and you, what you really focus yeah. on is all the connection and everything. But what you really have to focus on is the outside contours, right? And where all yeah. the the major landmarks are falling so um, yep. i could see how that would be tricky if you haven't done a lot of these things up front that your eye kind of keys in on the wrong things and you have to kind of train it to look at you know silhouettes and the outside and the overall form and not those little intersections absolutely um but at this point i'm still like you can see how the eyes are glowing a little bit that just indicates that like the ambient or the the shader i have on there has kind of like some ambient glow um yeah, I mean, at this stage, I'm still kind of like constantly jumping back and forth to that silhouette mode. And notice too, like the the hair is so important in this sketch. I mean, it's, it's kind of all about the hair. This hair was so fast to, to mock up because again, it's all volumes and it's big volumes. Um, at, at this point, when I was, at this stage, I was like, uh, you know, not exactly sure what was going on at the back of the hair. I, I was kind of imagining, oh, maybe it's kind of like held up with with a clip or something or, um, you know, some sort of hair accessory. And then, you know, everything on this side is just kind of like flyaways. Um, so that's kind of what I was playing with here. I eventually dropped that idea um, and just kind of made it hair. But, but what's important here is that like, you know, Again, I, I make like a couple, you know, shapes to, to work with, and then I just use them over and over and over and over again, just in different orientations, different scales. And within a couple minutes, you know, you, you have the silhouette of, of this like flowing hair. It's so fast, so direct, and so easily still manipulatable. Like if I just, you know, wanted to kind of like rework it or, you know, kind of like make adjustments, um, like it's, it's so easy at that stage, nothing's connected. So it's just really kind of like freeing and, and, um, loose. Um, I use, I just showed you how I, for lattices and things, I, I lattice things all the time. It's a really easy way to kind of like very quickly, you know, make adjustments kind of like wholesale to, to whole groups and whole parts. Um, lattices are, are, I think, a super powerful way to kind of, um, you know, kind of uh, just an important part of the workflow. So, 
So at this stage, um, I've, you know, again, thrown in some of the shading, um, just trying to kind of approximate some of the coloring going on. Um, at this point, I was still kind of like thinking about, you know, having the hair sort of tied up. I eventually I decided against it because I try not to invent whole new details in these in these sketches. Like I was thinking, you know, maybe if there was some indication in the drawing up here of like something, you know, at the back of the head that was maybe holding that hair up, I could kind of key off that. I decided though that, you know, since there was no indication of that, I would just sort of like, you know, have it just as the hair kind of like blowing in the breeze. Um, but yeah, so again, the, you know, I've added a little bit more complexity from that last version that you saw. In this case, um, uh, there's like some, some cool cast shadows in the artwork that again, all modeled in um, and with, you know, with different um, sort of subtle translucent shaders applied. Um, I think these are just like much faster and much more controllable than trying to mess with actual lights and shadows and, and spending a lot of time, you know, getting those to work right. Um, and again, since I'm not rendering, like all I want it to do is kind of like give the impression of a shadow. I can very directly um, dial in the, the color, the value, the you know, the overall effect of it. If I wanted to, you know, make it a little bit more transparent toward the bottom, again, that ramp technique I mentioned, you know, in the last one, so easy. Um, so, um, again, just kind of like layering these, these kind of simple building blocks and ingredients and, um, and, and you kind of, you're able to kind of come up with, uh, you know, a really kind of complete and satisfying looking image. Um, there's something in the artwork I love, you know, almost these kind of like brush stroke, um, you know, just kind of like moments of, of shadow here and there. Um, and even like the, you know, the outline around the eye, same thing that I did on the hands on the last one. This is just, um, the, the eye shape, um, duplicated. I think in this case, I didn't reverse the normal. I just kind of like pushed it back into the head a little bit. So what's reading as a line here is just the same eye shape that's in front here, just kind of like pushed back a little bit with a dark shader. So again, this is this is a volume back here. It's literally just a duplicate of that upper eyelid just pushed in. So what's revealed is the line. Again, really quick and easy much faster than kind of trying to create this line that noodles around and just tries to hug the surface, which inevitably as you like turn around, like, you know, you'd have like some wonkiness or wiggle to it. This just kind of like instantly gives you kind of a clean, a clean shape to work with. Um, I love this sort of like, you know, blush kind of brush stroke across the face which I achieved just, you know, by duplicating the shape. Um, I think it was the sort of like upper, upper face shape, moving it up, um, throwing a, a really translucent kind of peach shader on it and um, like a Lambert. And so from a distance, it kind of gives you the impression of that kind of like, you know, streak of blush across there. Yeah, that, that particular stick on there where you, it's kind of, again, the edges are all faceting because it's not a true nice clean intersection is really, uh -huh. for this particular style in, partic in particular, that little broken line and the kind of the shattering that goes with it where the polygons and whatever are hitting each other really adds to the overall look. Yeah. And I actually like, I like some of that kind of grittiness and, um, you know, the, the, Um, like the the effect of kind of things looking sort of CG, like that doesn't bother me at all. Um, so once I turn all the lights on, in this case, I again, I had spotlight in the front, spotlight in the back and an ambient. Um, this is the lights off version, bringing the lights on. 
it just kind of like smoothed things out a little bit. There's, you know, these are still those same um, faces or volumes that are kind of intersected together. Um, but layering on more of those techniques that I showed earlier, you know, I, the line work in here is, is really kind of like beautiful and gestural. Um, so I wanted to kind of capture that and kind of like, you know, the moving, the, moving those uh, kind of outline volumes this way or that way kind of like allows for thicker on one side, thin, thinner on the other side. Um, I, I was sort of adjusting the, the color of those outlines too. In this case, it was kind of like a much more transparent shape um, that just gives, because the, the face, you know, kind of needed to be a little bit softer. So, um, you know, kind of playing with the different kind of outline colors in that sense. Again, we, like we were talking about these kind of like nice moments of, of just kind of like uh, an area that's slightly shaded. Um, again, those are all volumes, just with very, very, very transparent shaders on them. And from a distance, it, all, it just kind of looks like a dab of like watercolor, you know? Um, so I used those kind of like all over the place. Same for the nostrils. Um, same for these kind of like, uh, just kind of indication of, of some anatomy underneath the, the lower eyelid. And, and these moments of, you know, that kind of feel just kind of like a, a brush stroke. Like these are all little volumes. I, I took the, the eyebrow shape, duplicated it, made it really skinny, just kind of scaled everything in along the normals and just use those kind of over and over, <clears throat> over, and over again to um, create these, you know, the impression of just kind of like, you know, like a dry brush technique kind of over that, uh, over that eye. And, and yeah. Um, so I have a question for you, Mike. Uh -huh. So you've been doing this right now on, it's, it's kind of singular images of characters or of portraits like this one or kind of portraits. Uh -huh characters have you ever thought or are you thinking about ever applying it to a larger scene uh yes actually i have some artwork that i found um of a it's not like a it, it's more of a set it's right. not okay. it, it's kind of like a vignetted set which i think could be really fun with this technique um i i have been kind of generally doing these just for characters um no particular reason, just kind of like for the fun of it. And the, you know, I don't really do character work at work. I work in sets. So it, it just kind of like a way to keep those creative juices flowing and do different things. Um, that's why I've been uh, working with the character stuff. Um, yeah, but I, I have kind of some plans for, for, for things like that. Because I could, I could even see this approach being applied to like a uh, an abstract painting or to just about anything in terms of that has some shape to it, some form to it. But it's also dealing with, you know, the the, the texture of the paint or things like that where it could be applied. I mean, it, it's just really cool, and I'm just curious how far you could mm -hmm. push it um, to see yeah. what else you can do. I think I feel like I've been um, approaching these more like maquettes, like more like if I was like. Because I've done a bit of sculpting in clay too um, over the past few years, um, which is also buried somewhere in my Instagram. Um, so these were kind of like a, an extension of that. Like it's, I'd be less inclined to like do a do a maquette of a of a set. Sure. Um, but having said that, like th these, there's no reason these techniques wouldn't work great for for an environment. Um, I wanted to point out one more thing too here, like. Again, the, the line work that you see in this kind of like tunic um, costume, it it looks like it's you know drawn on or just on the surface, but these are these are also all volume shapes that are just kind of pressed in to the surface. I think I just you know grabbed it from some other part of the model. Um, 
and just kind of like reused it all over the place. And just the part that's revealed is what gives you that line effect. That's so awesome. if there's like one takeaway, it's that like everything is volumes and kind of like the, the simpler you can work, the simpler shapes you can work with, the better. Um, can you select, can you select that shadow that's under the chin that's going down on the neck? I yeah. Think? So is that just the same technique where you're flipping the normal? Nope. Okay. No, in this case, I just duplicated the neck, scaled it out just a bit, um, took uh, the cut faces tool and just kind of like sliced that angle. Okay. Yeah and then applied the, probably the same shader that I had for the outline on this face. Okay, so I just want to say, you, Mike, you can't see the chat on YouTube, but I'll just echo pretty much what's been going on for 30 minutes, which was, wow. <laughs> 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 it's pretty much everybody's like, oh wait, my wait, goodness, wait. this is amazing. So you mean Mike is good at this? Uh, <laughs> I, Mike, I don't know anything about modeling, I'm an animator. Uh -huh. This is there. There's not a whole lot in 3D that I'm like, oh, that's you know, wow, that's amazing. This is like, I haven't said anything for for 50 minutes because I've been staring that's a, so close. That might be a record on a skate pod. I don't know. <laughs> it definitely is. Uh, I'm a little uh, not chatty in real life, but a, very chatty on the uh, live stream. But I've just <laughs> been like getting as close to my screen as I could. Cool. And oh, works. Thank you. So time wise, we're at about four o'clock. Um, so I don't know, Sean, if you want to. Yeah, let's see if we let's see if we have some questions. So if anybody out there has any any kind of questions out there, let's. I, I don't know if if we get a ton. Obviously, we can't answer everything, but. Are you okay on time, Mike? Let's start. Yeah, there. I'm. I'm totally fine. Um, okay. Should I stop my screen share? Uh, you can leave it for right now in case somebody okay. has something specific. I guess. Okay. Uh, I, I think it's yeah, it looks fine right now. So. So we'll see if we get any anything from the chat. It might be a little. There's a little bit of a delay. So, I'll bring up another example while we're while people are thinking or typing. I don't know if it's more amazing or depressing because it, you kind of get that Instagram. It's like, wow, that's so awesome, and then the amount. You know what I mean? It's, you, it's like <laughs> that challenge. But what I love about this is that it seems simple enough that just about anybody could jump into it and start experimenting. That, and I think that's what's awesome. Literally anyone could do this, and and. I say that because um, you don't have to know how to model in order to, to really do this. Um, one thing that's funny about this one that I wanted to kind of talk about is like, you see how crudely these things start. I mean, this, mo this illustration by Mo Andish is so adorable, so cute. My first take is like frightening, but it's, <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> Cause I'm like, you know, I'm mapping it out. I'm kind of trying to figure out like what is that anatomy that's actually, you know, making this thing so cute. Knowing nothing about bird anatomy, I'm like, oh well, you know, the beak just sort of like sits in the front of the of the face. And I tried that. And I'm like, wait a minute, no, this is not cute at all. What what's going on here? Um, so step by step, you know, I'm kind of like trying out different things. I First of all, I, I applied some kind of simple shading because I'm like, okay, you know, again, I want the facial expression and the kind of elements of the face to read super clearly. So I, I kind of threw some contrast in there, started, you know, pressed that beak much, much further into the, into the face, thinking like, okay, is this kind of starting to get there? You know, just to kind of black out that the opening again just kind of threw a volume in there quickly and you know just tumbling around kind of evaluating it trying to find find the cuteness um you can see just how absolutely crude these shapes are um but it's you know it i mean it's like a painting like it, it you kind of like I was in uh, a painting class once in art school and the teacher uh, told us like use the absolute biggest brush that you have. We had like a whole set of brushes that we had just bought. We were all new students. We had, you know, like a, a four inch, you know, almost like a painter's brush, like a wall painter's brush 
down to like, you know, a brush with like three hairs on it. And in this painting class, we're doing still lifes. And of course, everyone like re starts reaching for like these little brushes to start noodling. And she's like slapping these brushes out of everyone's hands. She's like, no, the big brush. And we're like, this thing? I mean, it was like, you know, half the size of the canvas practically. And, you know, it, it really makes a difference. Like you kind of start really, really broadly and kind of like building things up um, sort of in, in stages, in layers, and just like slowly refining as you go. Um, that's why, you know, as, you know, I got kind of far enough on the head and I'm like, all right, well, I have to get this body in here like right away because I don't want to, you know, sort of like, you know, perfect the, the head and then realize like, it doesn't really work with this body I've, I've mocked up. Um, so slowly kind of like dialing in the expression and, and noticing again, like how far that beak is being pressed further and further into the face and into the cheeks. Yeah, those cheeks are really coming out. Yeah, yeah for this three quarter, it's not totally clear like how enormous these cheeks are <laughs> but like you know as i'm like mapping it out in 3d it kind of became more and more clear um so starting to get some uh some more kind of you know finished shaders in there i've got some of my fong e's my lamberts um indicating like the the different kind of mouth parts just by throwing Sh different shaders on like there this is something that we used to do at dna all the time um and even like you know if i wanted this to kind of like fall off into black i remember um someone suggesting like oh just like grab the concentric rings you know of that geometry and just kind of give it progressively darker and darker yeah. lambert shaders to kind of like just kind of fake this uh gradient which i think you know is also a cool technique um so again i think i pushed the beak even further in and plumped those cheeks even further out but you can still see like how simple the 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 volumes are um and constantly tumbling around just trying to capture just the joy the absolute joy of this of the expression here So, <laughs> by the end, oh, man. Um, come on now. That's not fair. Get I out of here. Just like a little set for it, you know, kind of a little vignette. Um, the I I was looking through, um, you know, the illustrator for the very first image, the the singer, the jazz singer, uh, Annette Marna. She has, you know, a, just so many beautiful illustrations. Kind of this like classic French. Let me know how to describe it. Um, just really kind of like storybook feel. So there was an image I found of hers that just had like a beautiful palette um, of these kind of like, you know, peachy pinks and tans and olive greens. And so I kind of like, you know, was inspired by that a little bit um, in, in creating the, this little kind of like set uh, moment. For the bird to live live in um and and yeah so kind of applying different shaders to different faces just to kind of you know carve out a little bit of of detail where i wanted it but you know as i as i tumble around and as i kind of zoom in and out you can sort of see how still how kind of like simple and crude it is but the whole purpose and the whole driving force is to just capture the essence of the art as as quickly and simply and painlessly as possible. And then once I feel like I've gotten it, I do a screen grab, do a turntable, post it, and move on to the next one. So that way, that's how I've done about 20, 20 25-ish of these um, since, since last fall. Wow. Uh, so we do have just a couple of questions. One from Brian. He was asking about a, a, the lattice, uh, and I know that you had shown just a little bit earlier, but uh -huh. how much, like on a character like this, how much of, a, of the lattice are you using, and are you using it over big shapes to make huge adjustments, or is it small small adjustments? Um, 
kind of all over the place. I okay. mean, I'm, I'm likelier to, like, let's say I wanted to emphasize these hairs on the head. Like, I could go in here and grab points and, and you know, try, like, moving those out. But I'm, I'm much likelier to kind of, like, throw a lattice on that shape and, and kind of adjust things that way. It just gives you more control and more... Um, more like nice smooth fall off yep. than than if you're just kind of grabbing points. Would you say that's that's kind of like working with a big brush? I or think it, so. Yeah, I mean it, it's because you're not going in and pushing and pulling individual points. You're kind of going in and making mass bigger moves with larger tool to kind of. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, occasionally I will kind of go in and, and grab points if I need to. I mean, I, um, but it's like generally speaking, if I'm like oh actually i want this face to be a little bit wider you know or taller or skewed in a different direction it's so easy with a lattice and and very non-destructive and fast versus going in there and like you know nothing's connected so I, i'd be having to like you know kind of push and pull points on across multiple objects and try to kind of keep them lined up and stuff so lattices are, are just kind of a, a great way to make all sorts of adjustments. Like, let's say, you know, I wanted to make these wing tips longer, you know, I usually have lattices just set to two by two by two. Um, Cause it just, it gives you just lots of nice control and like, it's not really breaking anything anywhere, you know? Can you turn the lighting off on that one? Yes. Because we had a question about how it looks so smooth and comes together on the end, and I think the main thing is lighting at the end. Yeah. And yeah. then, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, okay. One was a, a general, like, about how much time do you spend on each of these? And then, more specific, um, are you adjusting your ambient occlusion at all on any of this to make it come together? Yeah. Um, let me go in reverse order. Sure. Uh, the, the viewport 2.0 settings are like, everything is kind of fair game. Like in certain cases, I might want more ambient inclusion to really kind of like, you know, get those volumes to feel separate from each other. In other cases, like for the Aphrodite model, which is just, you know, She's this goddess. It's, it had to be kind of like very luminous, and um, I didn't want lots of dark, you know, ambient occlusion shadows gathering in different places. So in that case, like I dialed it way down to like maybe 0.25 um, versus a default le level of one. Um, the the next question I think was how long do I spend? Yeah. Um, I, I try to do like three or four working sessions. Um, in some cases, they're actually a lot faster. Like the the guy I did, let's see. Um, this one I did in, in one sitting. And, you know, it was just based on this hilarious crayon drawing <laughs> that uh, Peter Emmerich had done. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of his. And, uh, you know, I, I was kind of intimidated by this one at first because I was like, oh, I don't know how, like, it's just a crayon outline. Like, does that mean, like, this guy is is actually just, you know, white, is like paper white or or what? Um, you know, there's just kind of, like, stuff to, to figure out. So, um, you know, this was a, a fun one that just kind of, like, came together quickly and yeah, I was like, yeah, I'm leaning into it. Like in, in the artwork, you know, there's just like this indication of like, there's some muscles happening here. You know what I mean? Like this is a, obviously like a muscular character just by the, the slight indication of, of the outline. So I kind of like leaned in and again, you can see like how kind of chunky and, and PC it is. It's just the volumes jammed together to kind of create the impression of, of that musculature. And in this case, 
I use that same outline technique that I showed you in the last couple examples. Um, but in this case, you know, kind of leaning into that aqua turquoise blue crayon line that, that Peter had used that I just thought was so fun and appealing. Awesome. So, so yeah, they they kind of vary, um, but three to four sessions is, is kind of like the most I want to spend. Okay. On your, uh, on your latest post, you had a character doing kind of like an idle animation floating there. Yes. Uh, how did you do that? Um, so in this case, the, the artwork was just so moody and so creepy uh, and just like evoked so much, so much of a mood. Um, yet was very, it was pretty pared back and, and simple. So I thought this might be kind of a fun opportunity to, to try something different and add just kind of like some subtle ambient um, like kind of barely there motion. Um, so yeah, it, it was that it actually came together really, really simply. I mean, the fact that these are all separate shapes and, you know, nothing has to have like, you know, nothing is rigged or weighted or anything like that. I've just grouped different elements, moved the pivot to where yeah. it needs to pivot from and just kind of like added uh, cyclical um, animations to it yeah with like various offsets just to kind of so nothing is kind of like lined up exactly you know it's really cool very but cool it kind of creates this like creepy breathing <laughs> yeah and, it adds a lot to it yeah so that's something i'm kind of like you know experimenting with just you know i'm always trying to do something new um so for a while i was just trying to you know do all sorts of different styles um, and then I was trying things kind of like, you know, trying to strip down the, the kind of elements to their just kind of bare, bare bones components and just seeing how much character I could get to read through. Um, so that was kind of like that, that exploration. Now I'm playing a little bit more with, uh, with subtle kind of keep alive animation. So, yeah, and then Todd, like you suggested, maybe you know, maybe the next one will be um, a set or an environment, you know, take on it. Um, what was the very first question that you guys asked? Was it about the lighting? Uh, yeah, but I think I think uh, I think you answered it. Yeah, um, there are so many settings um, in in the different shaders. Fong E, I think, has a lot of control. So just kind of like twiddling with the different settings and kind of dialing something in that you like is kind of the, the name of the game. I, I kind of do something a little bit different on, on every single one. Um, but it's kind of a, a combination of like Fong E, Blin, Lambert, and, and a few lights to kind of indicate um, the, you know, trying to capture the lighting scenario in the artwork. Although this one was kind of interesting because it, it was like a sketchy drawing. Like there's no indication of palette. It's like not really 3D friendly in any way. Um, so this was kind of fun to, this was kind of a, a departure for me in terms of like, I added a lot more than was in the art. Like kind of making up a whole new palette, making up, you know, this little kind of like setting scenario for, for the bird. because. I could, the the way the the toes were kind of curled here, I was like, it didn't seem like he was or she was like standing. It felt nothing more like a perch kind of um, yeah. position. So that's kind of what what inspired that. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So, do you want to uh, talk about the contest, Sean? Let's do it. Well, you, well, you you wrote it. You wrote the rules. So you oh, know man. the most. Yeah, However, because of what Mike said, I got to go back and adjust a few things. <laughs> I made some assumptions that were incorrect. <laughs> oh no! No, it's all right. So I'm going to share my screen again, Sean. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, all right, we'll try this. Hold on, just a second. And okay, we're good. 
All right, everyone. So what we've done here, and this I know it's a little bit small, so we've placed a link uh, underneath. I think it's underneath this live stream. It'll be there underneath the recording as well. Should be in the description. Uh, okay. So Perfect. let us know if you can't see it or 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 uh, get into it. So what we've done um, in consultation with uh, Mike was we reached out to another friend of Escape Pod, an artist named Jeff Harvey. Uh, Jeff has worked with Sean and I on a couple on a, another project that we're going to be talking about on the show. Uh, it's a, it's a an animated series project where he designed some characters for us. But what we're going to introduce is the 3D modeling ske or sketch modeling challenge. So uh, in the PDF document that's been posted, this contest is going to start today. Um, right after this session is over, it can start. It's going to end on Sunday, May 16th by 11.59 p.m. Central Time. So you've got time. Um, what's that? You've got time. Plenty of time. And one of the reasons we're doing that is because we have a lot of students uh, who are who are watching or getting involved and we want to give students our semester tends to end right around the beginning of May and that gives about two weeks after uh, that ends for people to kind of throw down on this in case you're too busy leading up to that. So there's plenty of time doesn't mean you have to wait that long you can jump in and get it done ahead of time if you want to and still submit it. Um, we put a link. Uh, let's see we put a link to this particular uh, escape pod episode so people can go back and rewatch it really easily so that links right back. It has what the submissions must include, and that includes a 19 by, or so let's just say a 1080 HD image showing a side-by-side -side comparison of the sketch and of your finished kind of sketch model. We'd also like to see a 1080 image of the sketch model as it is kind of its final state of, uh, opposite a sketch model that has the wireframe on it. So we can see just a little bit about the shapes and the forms and the simplicity. You saw some examples of what Mike was doing with that um, as he was just kind of going through some of his latest works. Um, we also want a six second, it says rendered video. That's incorrect. It's now a play blast video using viewport 2.0 view, <laughs> viewport um, or it could be rendered. If you want to do something rendered, that's fine too. But I'm going to update the document to make sure we address that. Um, six seconds long and we'd like to get that as an MP4 or as an H2, uh, H.264. Uh, um, so play blasts are technically allowed. AVIs are not allowed because they're too big. Um, so, and we have a link to Mike's Instagram that shows some turntable examples of kind of how he was setting up some of his work that you can reference. We also need a text document. It could be a Word document, PDF text uh, that gives us your name, your email address, so we can contact you should you win. Uh, we'd like to know what kind of software you used. Um, and we'd also like you just to kind of denote in simple terms whether you're a high school student, or you're a university student, if you're a professional, or if you're other. Um, just so we have some basic information about uh, who's basically participating in these types of events. To submit those, we've created an email link that goes to one of our box accounts that allow you to email your stuff directly in. We ask you to please try to zip your files up and keep those zip files under 10 megabytes to make sure that they uh, transfer properly, which shouldn't be too hard to do. Um, winners, okay, so we're gonna have different categories. And again, this was done in, in kind of consultation with Mike's, so we're gonna have best overall interpretation, best silhouette, most appealing, most unique workflow slash techniques, most complicated slash uh, complex, and most elegant. So what is the prize? Why do you wanna take on this awesome journey? Well, one, because this stuff is fun. You saw how fun this could be. Uh, it should be exciting based on what Mike just showed. But we're gonna select winners, one winner for each of those six categories, and we're gonna reconvene with those winners on a special escape pod with Mike where they can talk about their work and show their work. And what we're gonna do then is that won't be live stream, but what we'll do then is we'll have that session and we will post that at some point so that everyone can kind of check out what was said. Um, but it's your chance to have one-on-one -on -one questions with Mike um, about this type of process, about your models and get some feedback directly from him and what he liked about your work. Um, and like it says at the bottom there, one of the things we talk about in the skate pod all the time is we're kind of figuring a lot of this stuff out on the fly. Um, we're trying new things. Sean and I are, are getting into Toon Boom Harmony and all kinds of new software that we haven't used before. But our motto is kind of don't. I made this motto up, Sean, so we're going with this, right? <laughs> just say, just don't, say, don't wait until you're awesome. <laughs> Be awesome by not waiting, right? <laughs> Jump in, take these contests, do these things because too many people wait until they feel like they're amazing at all these things to show their work. And that's not the point, right? Do the work, put it out there, let people see it get better every time you do it. Um, that's why we want to do these contests. That's why we're hoping a lot, a number of you want to jump in. Uh, with us and, and kind of take part. Now, what are you going to be building? So what is, what's the sketch model going to look like? Well, like we said, we reached out to our friend Jeff Harvey and he was allowing us to use six of his awesome images that Mike selected. Um, of these six characters, you can pick one and try to build a sketch model that you can submit. Now, you could sketch model all of them if you'd like, but you can only submit one. Um, so go through, select whichever character you think is most interesting to you. 
Uh, and the idea then is to carry that forward uh, based on the process that Mike was showing, plus whatever improvements you can make and ideas that you can try. Um, but we're trying to replicate these just like was shown earlier. One last thing that we've got is a couple examples. We talked about the 1080 images that we want. I placed a couple examples in the back here that kind of show this wireframe is obviously drawn on top. It's just, it's just as a reference, I didn't have the wireframe of Mike's work for that. So uh, that just shows you the two images that we want that come along with the text document and with the video file. So um, all of that, like we said, is going to be due on by Sunday, May 16th. We've got that awesome prize to be able to hang out for a little while with Mike Altman and, and, and us and talk about your models and get some feedback and, and just you know, ask questions and answer questions should be a good time. So hopefully that's in, that's appealing to people. We want people to take part in these. We plan on doing many more contests like this. Um, so we're just hoping that everyone's interested and wants to throw down with us. Is that good, Sean? That was perfect, Todd. A anything you want to add, Mike? <laughs> no, I love it. Um, I guess the only thing I would add is um, don't be afraid to choose something that scares you in the sense that like you may not know how you how to do it or how to approach it um that can sort of inspire a lot of kind of creative thinking and innovative ideas so don't think like oh that's the easy one so i'm going to do that you know what i mean pick one that you kind yeah. of don't have any idea how you would even approach it yeah and i like the ones that you selected because they all have something a little bit different about them but they all still have a real sense of energy and there's there's something going on the character's thinking something or doing something it just mm -hmm. they have a certain quality to them um i should say also that just as a, as a future episode we also gonna have just jeff harvey is going to be coming on to talk about his artwork and about his process for making these particular images so um, if that's something you're into if you're into concept art and you're into how to draw these characters and kind of some of the, the uh, things that happen in terms of either marker running, Photoshop running, all those types of things are gonna be coming up on future episodes. Uh, so check it out. Sean, anything before we uh, close up here? Uh, no, I just wanted to say I had seen the artwork before uh, and I was like, oh, these are really cool. They're, they're a lot of fun. And then seeing Mike's process makes me look at it in a totally different way. <laughs> <laughs> so then I'm like, uh, in a different way, but I'm like, oh, wow, you could really do something cool with that one where I hadn't really thought about it before. So You, you can't win, Sean, even if you do one. <laughs> trust me, I'm not going to do one because uh, <laughs> even though he said you don't, know how, you don't have to know how to model, uh, I really don't know how to model. So, uh, I mean, if you, if you can tumble around Maya, you can do that. <laughs> Like I, I, I that don't might be asking a lot of him. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm an animator, Mike. Uh, I don't know if you've met many of us, but <laughs> they have people tumble for them. Yes. <laughs> uh, oh, well, one last thing I would mention: like, feel free to use any software too. Like, if you're more comfortable in ZBrush or Blender or 3D Studio Max or whatever, like this, these techniques can kind of be adapted to any any software package. I just use Maya because I'm comfortable in it and I have it here. But um, if you're more comfortable in another software, that's fine too. Cool. Yeah. That great yeah, advice. It, and it's, it, yeah. Anything kind of goes on this. So just try it out and see. Um, the one thing that does make pretty clear in the document is don't make a full on production model. Don't make a full on crazy ZBrush sculpt. Stick within yeah. the scope of the sketch kind of qualities that Mike was showing in his models and whatnot. And then we're good to go. Yeah. So I want to say a very special thank you to Mike. Uh, I know we went over time a little bit, but thank you for, for, for showing us as much as you did and going through the process. And thank you for just coming up with it. This is awesome. I think it's one of the coolest things I've seen in terms of the application of modeling in a long time. Um, and it's got, yeah. I think it's got a lot of people really excited to go and try it for themselves. Yeah, I'm, it's so fun for me to kind of like be able to inspire people to, to get excited about modeling and, and sketching and, and try it out. Um, so that's just like, you know, makes it even more rewarding. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's, I mean, honestly, being serious, that was some of the coolest stuff that I've seen in a, in a, in a while. So, uh, thank you and much. thanks, and thanks for sharing it with us and, uh, for our, with our students and everybody else. And I know we have a full on high school class that was watching. Uh, so they said 30 students in there. Uh, oh, wow. so, so very cool. Uh, yeah. Well, 
I think that just about does it for this episode. Um, again, it'll be it'll be posted up here shortly. You can go back, you can rewatch it if you're doing the contest and you want to go back and check it out again just to kind of see more of what Mike was doing. Feel free. Um, but we look forward to uh, to seeing what you come up with for the contest. So yeah, don't forget if you like this, subscribe, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification button. Also, our regular Tuesday at 10 o'clock live stream will be taking place. Uh, so we'll see you tomorrow if anybody wants to come to that. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Awesome. Thanks, All right. everybody. Thanks. Cool. See you later. And we are done.